Well, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Bridgeway Church. Once again, we are thrilled to be connecting with you, and uh, not just on any Sunday, but today is Mother's Day, and uh, so we're celebrating all the moms that are a part of the Bridgeway family, and uh, today if you're watching and you're a mother or grandmother, we just want to say that we honor you. While we're not able to be with you today in person, uh, please know that we're thinking about you and just asking the Lord to bless you today. It's a great privilege for us to be able to connect with you and possibly with your family today. Maybe you're gathered in home or maybe you're uh, on vacation. Uh, either way, I want you to know it's a pleasure to connect with you. Uh, for everyone out there, we say hello to us. As always, we've got somebody online with you. Love to hear from you and uh, that'll be a blessing to us. Let me take a moment to welcome our guests. If you're new with us at Bridgeway, uh, my name is Joel Eason. I serve as the senior pastor. And on behalf of our church family, we say welcome. It really is a high honor for us to connect with you. And if today is a blessing to you, if watching online uh, is beneficial to you, we'd love at some point to uh, get to meet you in building. And uh, we'd love to have you there. And if you join us for one of our services in building, uh, we always ask this, following the service that you attend, would you come and introduce yourself to me? Uh, I always get a, a great privilege out of getting to connect with uh, new guests, and so I'd love to make your acquaintance. Now for everybody, uh, we're going to have an amazing time of worship together. We've got three songs that we're going to be singing today. Uh, we're going to sing Stand in Your Love, and then we're going to sing Let Your Spirit Fall, and we'll close things out with a song called Waymaker. And uh, we say this so often, but I hope you know it and I hope you really take it to heart. Uh, we don't want to just watch worship and just hear worship, but we want to respond. We want our hearts to be open. We want our mouths to be the ones declaring the, the praises of the Lord. And so uh, I pray that wherever you find yourself that you're worshiping today. Following our worship time, we'll have a few announcements and we've got quite a few things going on. You'll hear about our 6K walk that's coming up, and that's a big one. That's an important one. So you'll want to make sure you're ready, uh, maybe even with your phone, uh, to do a QR code and to scan that and make sure you get registered. There's going to be a lot of people participating with that. And uh, then you'll also hear about Inside Bridgeway. We've got that coming up on the 22nd. That's always for our guests and for people that are new trying to hear more about who Bridgeway is, our history, our strategy, and we tour the building. So if you're new with us, that's a great Sunday to join in building because you get to tour the building following the second service. And then you'll also hear about a men's event with a Rays game and uh, possibly some other things. But we want you to know that uh, we'd love to have you participate. And then today we're going to be closing out our series uh, in Divide and Conquer. We started this Easter Sunday and today we're wrapping it up. And uh, it's been a great series for us so far. Hopefully it's been an encouragement for you. Uh, last week we finished with Matthew chapter 11 talking about come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden or burdened. And Jesus said, now I'll give you rest. And I want to follow up with one passage that we've said for a couple of times during the course of the series. It comes from Revelation 12 and it says that they triumphed or the Greek word nakao, they overcome, they conquer, they triumphed uh, over him being the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You know, through this series, that's our prayer is that you would overcome. No matter what you're going through, that you would see yourself following the Lord to victory because He has made you to be an overcomer. And uh, we pray that you are uh, seeing the victory of the Lord in your life. I want you to know that we're excited that you're with us. We're going to have a great time together today. As always, we have sermon notes, so make sure that you take a moment to download those. Those will be a benefit to you. Maybe even have your phone ready for some screenshots as we go along. But let's be ready to worship and have an amazing day together. And for all you moms, happy Mother's Day. God bless you all today.
church it is such a great honor to be with you today it is mother's day and we're so glad to have if you are a mother or a grandmother or if you take care of children happy mother's day to you why don't you stand to your feet while we get ready to worship our king this morning amen Let's sing this out together. One more 
Can we just put our hands together this morning? Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for who you are. God, we thank you for this opportunity this morning. God, as we could quiet our spirits, as we could turn our eyes and look towards heaven, we thank you, Lord, that we have a firm foundation. God, that things in this life may let us down. Father, that uncertainty may be all around us, but Jesus, we thank you, Lord. God, that you have traded heaven to come to earth to die on a cross to save us. So Lord, we ask you, God, as we draw near to you, Lord, with these songs, with our hearts, with our words today, God, as we draw near to you, Father, we pray that you would draw near to us. We just give you the glory in Jesus' name. stripped away but you God take us deeper move us further into depths of new life with you stir our passion you're releasing
our week and our days, God. Stir up. away. Thank you, Lord, that you are our provider. Lord, that you say in your word that, behold, I'm going to do a new thing. You're going to make paths in the wilderness. You're going to make streams in the desert. Father, we come before you today, Lord, as our provider, is our shelter, is our peace. Jehovah Shalom, our peace. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are who you say you are. And Jesus, we bring you our faith today. We bring you our expectation. God, that you created everything. You created the heavens and the earth. You created us. 
Lord, if you know, if you see the, the sparrow, if your eyes are on the sparrow, God, surely you see us, God. So we come before you today with our faith. Jesus, that you are the way maker. That even when we can't see it, God, that you are in our midst. Stop 
You never stop working You never stop You never stop working Even when I don't see it you're working Even when I don't feel it you're working You never stop You never stop working You never stop You never stop working Even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. Father, we just give you the praise this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to use our voice. Lord, to lift up our hands and worship you. God, even though sometimes life is uncertain, we thank you, God, that we could praise you in advance. So we just give you the glory, give you the praise, Jesus. Come on, can we just sing that one more time? Nice and loud, that is who, just a voice. That is who you are. That is who you that is who you are. That is who you are. Yes, Lord, we declare this morning. That is who you are. 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 Come on, let's just put our hands together today. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your victory. God, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. That even when we can't see it, God, that you are working, that you are faithful. And today, Lord, we just bring our faith and our expectation, Jesus. Lord, that you want to encourage us today, God, that you want to do something brand new in our lives. So, Father God, we just thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen. 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 Well, welcome. Thank you for coming to church today on this beautiful Mother's Day. If you're in building... Uh, take a second, say hi to the person next to you, say it's good to see you, shake their hand, and after that you may be seated. For those of you joining us online today, we're super thankful uh, for you joining us today and participating in service. Pray that you are blessed in worship, and uh, we have a powerful message for you today. And so, uh, pray that you enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning. Welcome to Bridgeway. My name is Pastor Joseph, and I serve as a young adults pastor here. It is great to have you join us this morning. Now, if you are here for the first or the second time, whether you're in building or part of the online family, we are happy that you decided to join us. We want to better serve you and get information into your hands about Bridgeway. Now, the best way for us to do that is for you to let us know that you've joined us by filling out a Connect card. If you're in building, grab the Connect card that is in a seat back pocket right there in front of you. Go ahead and fill that out. And on your way out of the sanctuary, after service, you can drop that into one of the black boxes that's by the exit doors. Or you can go ahead and give it to one of the ladies at the guest services table. Likewise, if you're new and joining us online today, we ask that you click the link in the chat that's right above you. And it says, I am new. 
When you click that link, you'll be taken to our virtual Connect card. Once we receive that Connect card, we'll email you some information on the best ways that you can get connected with our church family. Again, we are so happy that you joined us today and welcome you to our church family. So sit back and have a great time with our service. Good morning, Bridgeway Church, both in building and online. We are so excited. Today is Mother's Day. Can we just give it up for all of the moms? Yes, all of the mothers and grandmothers. Every wonderful woman in the Bridgeway family who has invested into the lives of other people through your own children, either through birth or adoption or foster care or by marriage or just the investments that you've made into the people that are around you, we celebrate you and we thank you. We are all better that you are in our lives. And so one more time, can we just celebrate all of these wonderful women and mothers? Happy Mother's Day. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Travis Moffitt, and I'm the missions director here at Bridgeway Church, and I have a few quick announcements for you this morning. First of all, if you are new to Bridgeway, maybe this is your first Sunday here or you're in your first year here, and you'd like to find out some more information about Bridgeway, uh, we have a great event coming up on uh, May 22nd, and this is called Inside Bridgeway. It'll give you an opportunity to spend some time with Pastor Joel and with the staff here. Uh, we'll take you on a tour of the building and tell you a little bit about the history of Bridgeway and the vision of Bridgeway going forward. This event will be right after the 11 o'clock service uh, right here on campus. It'll take just a little over an hour, and we're going to feed you. And uh, so that's fantastic. There's no cost to you to participate, but we would ask that you would register. Um, online, you can click that I'm new button and register right there on that link. Or if you're in building, you can take the connect card that's in the seat back right in front of you, fill that out, drop that in the drop boxes on your way out. That way we know that you're coming. We make sure we have enough food for everybody, all right? Secondly, the average child around the world who does not have access to clean water in their home uh, will walk an average of six kilometers a day to go and get that clean water and bring it to the house. And we want to do something about that here at Bridgeway. So we're partnering with World Vision uh, with a, a fun fundraiser to help provide clean water for children around the world. So we're hosting a six kilometer walk right here on campus on Saturday, May 21st. Our goal is to raise $8,000, and I'm so excited to report we've already raised $2,000 towards this goal. That's fantastic. Yes, come on. So we just need about 120 more people to register. So I've got like 60 over here and 60 right here, and we're done. So you can register today uh, for that. It's $50 per person. You can scan the QR code that's on the screen, or you can email penny at penny at bridgeway.tv. And we wanted to, to encourage you to come out, have a fun time. There's going to be some food trucks here. There's going to be some uh, music going on here. Um, there will be both a dirt track as well as a paved track. And if you're like, I just can't make six kilometers, that's fine. Come out, do what you can, uh, and just enjoy a fun time together here. It's going to be a, a, a great, great time. Lastly, for all of the men in the house, we have an awesome men's event coming up. Uh, we're going to be taking a trip over to the baseball game on May 28th to see the Rays versus the Yankees. And uh, we acquired 49 tickets. We've only got tw uh, 20 tickets left. Uh, the tickets are $49 a piece. And so you need to go ahead and get your ticket today. If you want to bring your son with you, that's great. They need to be 18 years of age or older. You can email Pastor Joseph at joseph at bridgeway.tv uh, to register for that and get all the information for that. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we love you so much, and we acknowledge you, Holy Spirit, your presence here in this place with us. Lord, as we just sang, you are the way maker, and you make a way in our lives. And so we speak blessings over every person here in building or connected online. We speak blessings over every mother and grandmother. God, and we open up our hearts and our minds and our lives, Lord, to listen to you, to learn from you, and to receive you. We love you, Lord. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.
We celebrate you. No other group is overworked and underappreciated than our moms, and uh, we celebrate you. When we were clapping for our moms earlier, I leaned over to my wife, who's the mother of our four kids, and said, was that worth it, you know, with all the clapping? And she's like, absolutely. Uh, we, we do celebrate you, moms, and uh, for those of you at home as well. Hey, today we're continuing and closing out a series that we've been in for a few weeks entitled Divide and Conquer, and hopefully at home you've got those sermon notes as well as in building, hopefully you have those. And I want to give just a little bit of a recap. This recap will be very brief, but just so that if you're new with us, watching possibly, uh, you know where we've been uh, so that there's a platform as to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we started this series three weeks ago at uh, Easter weekend, and we did a talk entitled From the Top Down. And uh, while we were talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we zeroed in on the visual that it says that when Jesus died, uh, that this curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, a very large curtain, 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, four inches thick. And uh, that depicted um, something very important, that access to the presence of God was now available ongoing and to everyone, not just one time a year, not just to one particular person. And in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, it defines that the curtain was representative of his body. I think that's verse 21 or 22. And uh, so we understand from the beginning of this series that we can walk with the presence of God in our lives. And that's important for you, no matter what you go through, no matter where you are, no matter what day it is, you can walk in the presence of God and you can experience him. Secondly, in the second week, we talked about uh, this reality that we're more than a conqueror through Christ, uh, but that doesn't eliminate that we go through tough times and that evil will sometimes try and derail you. And uh, we utilized a visual out of Psalm 23, but we said that no matter what the enemy wants to bring our way, uh, the Lord is greater. And that set the platform for what we talked about last week with a house divided. A very famous line that lots of us have heard, a house divided against itself cannot stand. But uh, Jesus was not referring to a group of people just saying the same thing, but he was actually depicting that Jesus' power was greater than the enemy's power. And we see that from the miracle that took place uh, with him healing and delivering a person from an evil spirit. And it's from all that that we're going to build into this last talk for us today. And uh, so hopefully these sermon notes will help you. We're going to be reading out of the book of Mark chapter 9. And I want to give two caveats before we start kind of walking through because we're going to do a little bit of a slow Bible study. Uh, before we do so, two caveats. Number one is even though it's Mother's Day, the story we're going to read pertains to a dad. And so uh, I hope moms that's okay um, because we're not zeroing in. I'm not trying to, you know, push Father's Day yet. Um, but we're just going to learn some things about the, the tension and the, the difficulty of a dad, of a parent. And uh, there's going to be some really important things out of that. Secondly, the second caveat is whether or not you're a parent or not, there are going to be some transferable principles for sure out of this. So no matter what context you're in, parent or not a parent, old or not older, I think there's some things inside of this story that are important for us. So uh, to, to get into it, we're going to be reading out of Mark chapter 9. And before I show the first verse that we're going to look at, let me set where Jesus is. Jesus is coming to the scene that we're about to read. He's not presently there. He's coming to it. And where he had been was with three disciples, as it's depicted, Peter, James, and John. They had gone to a mountain. It's not depicted in this passage, but it's known to us as Mount Tabor. It's a very specific mountain in the Jezreel Valley. It's where the transfiguration happens. It's where the disciples, Peter, James, and John, see Jesus glorified in magnificent fashion. Well, from that, they're going to come down and they're going to uh, reassociate or regather with the rest of the disciples. So with that, let's read out of Mark 19, verse 14. It says, when they came to the other disciples, so Jesus, Peter, James, and John, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. 
What are you arguing with them about, he asked. Now, let's pause there and kind of unpack that. So Jesus comes down to where they are, and uh, he finds the remainder of his disciples outside of Peter, James, and John in the midst of an argument. A lot of people there, a crowd, and uh, Pharisees, religious order, who are challenging them. And he's going to ask the disciples what's going on, why all this hoopla, why all this arguing. But just imagine that there's this volume there. This is quite animated. For instance, the word that we have here for arguing, as you see in the screen and in your sermon notes, is setzedio, setzedio. And uh, Sidzedio was to seek or to investigate. If you were trying to inquire of something, you could use this word. If you were a parent and asking your kids what happened to the chocolate chip cookies, you know, you could use this word. If you were asking somebody at work what happened to the whatever, you could use this word. And uh, so often in Scripture, it's used to question. So when you and I read in the New Testament in the English, we're often going to find the word question to question something. It it would be this Greek word that's in play. Um, I just would insert the reality that there are cultures, and I want to say this very uh, PR, uh, there are cultures and people that will argue with higher animation and higher volume than some other people and some other environments. Like some people, when they argue, it's very calm. You didn't even know they're in an argument because they're just getting along and just talking. And then some people, when they argue, I mean, it is demonstrative. There are props involved. Things could be flying, you know, and there's lots of animation and tears. And so the, the Jewish community of old as a whole would have been more on the volume animation side. So Jesus is coming into a volume, coming into an environment, a hoopla. And he's going to ask the disciples, what is going on here? What are you arguing about? Now, that's an important question for you. Even though you don't live in this context, this question that you see on the screen is important for us today. And we're going to lean into it. What are you arguing about? So just file that away for a second. What are you arguing about? So let's go back to the story now in verse 17. So a man in the crowd answered, Teach I, Teacher, I brought you my son. Now pause here. Let me just say something. I didn't say this in the first service, but this word teacher is didactylos. It was a Greek word, didactylos. And didactylos was someone who's an authority. You and I might say uh, a doctor. Uh, somebody who is advanced, somebody who has great prestige. This is not just somebody who's assigned to a small, you know, uh, responsibility. Didactylos was a high order person. And this dad comes out and he says, I'm the reason all the arguing is happening. I brought to you my son. And the reason that the crowd is fighting with the disciples and the teachers or, or the religious order are fighting with the disciples uh, is because I brought you my son. And you weren't here. And so we'll find out because you weren't here, I asked them to get involved. And it didn't go as I had hoped. And he says, uh, so I brought to you my son who is uh, possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. And then this is an interesting statement. Don't race past it. Whenever it seizes him. Now pause there. Let's just pause there for a second. Whenever it seizes him. Like it doesn't always, it doesn't always go this way. Some days we have good days. Some days we have some good situations. Some days we have good hours. Good, it's a good day. But whenever it shows up, we have a bad day. When it gets bad, it gets really bad. So if anybody ever has been in a scenario where we're like, we have good days and we have bad days. Our marriage is good and then it's bad. With my kids, it's good and then it's bad. We have good days. But when we have bad days, when we have off days, it gets really off. He says, whenever it seizes him, uh, it throws him to the ground and uh, he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. 
So I came looking for you, and you weren't here. So I asked them to do it, and they couldn't. It's an interesting thing. I came to the church, and I was looking for you, Lord, and I found some of your workers and asked them to pray for me, and it didn't work. We didn't get better. It didn't change the thing. And so you have this scenario where uh, he's asking the disciples, can you help me? Now, the reason he's going to ask them is depicted in just a little bit. We're, we're going to lean into that. But there are three dilemmas that come to the surface for me from the beginning. When I read this, I see three dilemmas that I would lean in on. Dilemma number one is this. You have a desperate and defeated parent who had an unmet plea. You have a parent who is defeated, who's desperate. So they've brought their child. Like, for instance, if you think about on the parental side, if there's one thing that, that grabs your heart more than any, if there's one thing that you wanted to go well, it would be for your children. And when it doesn't go well for your children, that's the hardest thing for you. Now, as a non-parent, anybody who's not a parent, this just has not been your path, you're not, you're not in this situation, um, you could lean into the reality of your deepest or most severe disappointment. If like my most severe disappointment uh, surfaced and I had to live in that, how do I deal with that? That's the dilemma. And, um, and it would have been at the highest order. And this isn't just a dad who it's wa he's watching it with one child. He's watching it with his only child. For instance, Luke chapter 9 offers us a little bit of extra information. Luke chapter 9 says this. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. Now, think about this. Let me ask you a question. And I can't poll you at home, but I can poll you here. Uh, how many of you uh, were... Uh, the last child in your family? Yeah, okay. How many of you, another question, how many of you were the first born in your family? Yeah, we don't like you. <laughs> it went way easier. Yeah, you were coddled, you know? Uh, maybe not in all situations. But in lots of situations with that first kid, I mean, everything's got to be perfect. The parents watch them sleep. Oh, look at him. Little precious. Little precious. Keep it quiet. Keep it dark. With, when you get to number two, three, or four, my fourth is sitting over here. Vacuums are going. Lights are on. Jackhammering because you're doing construction. They just deal with it, right? With binkies, little binkies for the firstborn, I mean, you clean it when it's spit on the ground. You clean it, disinfect it, towel wipes, everything. With uh, the last one, I mean, you pick it off the ground and do one, two, <laughs> back in. Right? It's different. It's different when you're the youngest. So this dad has his only child. And he went to Jesus. Jesus wasn't there. He went to the disciples, and they couldn't do anything about it. So that's dilemma number one. Dilemma number two is the disciples. They're a believing team of people who were unable to change dilemma number one. Uh, the reason that he's going to ask them to help and try and drive out this spirit is because they had become known for that ability. Remember, we're reading in Mark 9. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus gave the disciples authority over evil spirits, sent them out two by two. And uh, it reads this in Mark chapter 6. It reads, uh, Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. In Luke chapter 10, we read that they're going to come back together and there's going to be kind of this real uh, exaltation, this excitement at the power that they had witnessed. And Jesus is going to try and calm them down a bit. And he's going to say this, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rather that your names are written in heaven. Now, let me lean into that for a second, because that's important to this story, I think. 
Um, one of the amazing things that you get to watch sometimes when you follow the Lord, and this is really amazing, is when the supernatural is impacted by the natural. When God uses you as a man or a woman to be part of his supernatural sovereign work, it's astonishing when it happens. If you've ever been in a place where you pray for somebody and by God's doing, he heals that person. I'm not talking like he gradually kind of feels better, but I'm talking a healing. It is an astonishing thing. If you've ever been in an environment where God gives you a word for somebody, you didn't come up with it on your own, you didn't have information beforehand, he just gives you a word, and you share that with somebody, and it's life to them, it's like a light in a desperate moment. It's an incredible moment. And when the anointing is on you, and the supernatural involves the natural, it can lead you into one of two directions. It can lead you into really strong humility, of saying, Lord, I didn't do that. I don't know why you chose to use me. That's overwhelming to me a bit, but to you is the glory. I want none of the glory. And you try and reserve your place to a very humble state. The other direction that it can go sometimes is it can build pride in you, where you can start to grow a little um, confident in how God used you to the point that it can eventually become in somebody's thinking or feeling that I'm pretty special. Like the anointing's on me. I have the ability. You need somebody to pray for you. You need me. You need somebody to prophesy over you. You need me. I'm the one with the anointing. Any of us at home or here who have ever witnessed where you see somebody who's highly anointed and highly prideful at the same time, it most likely didn't start that way. It most likely started humble, but then kind of gradually grew to this pride. I say all that to say that this is an interesting thing that the disciples have been given a mandate, a calling to them. I'm sending you out. You have authority over the spirits. They saw it happening. Now this time it doesn't work. So you're in that place that I believe God and I believe his calling and I believe his word. It just didn't work for me this time. If you've ever been in that place that I believe in God's word about healing, it just didn't work for me. I believe in God's provision, it just didn't work for me. Or you stepped out and tried to be used by the Lord and it just didn't work. That's where the disciples are at right now and they're in dilemma number two. And because they're in dilemma number two, that invites dilemma number three. And that is the crowd and the Pharisees who start lobbying attacks against them. See, you have no grounds. And they start to discredit the claims of Jesus. They start to discredit the claims that other people had made of Jesus. And there's just this collision, this collision of dilemmas. And anytime you have collision of dilemmas, whether the dad, whether the disciples, whether the crowd watching, you have a collision of dilemmas, you typically have arguing. Why do we argue so much? Why do you argue at work? Why do you argue at home? Why do you argue with the person you shared a vow with? Why do you are you with the people you share DNA with? Why do you are you more times than not? You have collision of dilemma. And so it's an interesting scenario. How does Jesus respond to this? And when you're in the midst of a dilemma and some measures of unbelief are surfacing, which we'll see in just a moment, how does Jesus answer that? How does Jesus answer me when we're arguing and we're in a dilemma collision? And my unbelief about this changing is starting to surface. So we'll go back to the text here. It says in verse 19, O unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now that's an interesting set of statements. When you read it at first, it looks really hard. So let's kind of piece it together here. Unbelieving. Greek word apistos. And it's just the negative firm form of pistos. And pistos meant to believe or to be easily persuaded by, uh, to trust. 
So apistos is the antithesis of that. I don't easily trust. I don't easily get persuaded. I'm not easily believing. And he's saying to this group who are in dilemmas, he said, you're not easily believing right now. And then he says a statement that has been difficult for me to wrap my head around at times. When he says, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Because at first glance, it really looks like he's trying to separate. And when your unbelief is surfacing, does Jesus try and separate from your dilemma? Does Jesus try and separate from your lack of belief in the moment? Um, On Tuesdays, as a staff, we do devotions every Tuesday. One of our staff members will lead it. And uh, this week, uh, I was the one leading it, and we just read through Psalm 62 and then had dialogue around Psalm 62. And in Psalm 62, there's one line that indicates how long. It's a how long question. He says, how long, basically, will my accusers continue to advance? That's not the exact wording, but it's that context. And one of the things that was dialogued about that from the staff was saying that when in scripture you deal with how long questions, rarely is it a chronos answer. Like how long must I deal with this is not being answered by, well, three weeks, two days, and 14 hours. Sometimes when you and I pray, how long do I have to stay at this job? How long till we see the miracle? How long till this counseling kicks in? How long till they return to you, God? It's not answered by a chronos question. It's depicting your emotions. The how long question depicts the weight of the emotions involved. And so we use statements like that to depict this is hard for me. This is hurting me. I'm emotional about this. I would only contend that when Jesus is saying how long, that it's depicting the emotion here. Because people and theologians and pastors and people who study the scripture have wrestled with this passage for a long time and have asked, who was he identifying? Like, was he talking to the dad in dilemma number one? Was he talking to the disciples in dilemma number two? Was he talking to the crowd in dilemma number three? Who was this directed at? And I think you could contend that he's just depicting the emotion involved with when dilemmas are colliding, creating arguing, and unbelief is surfacing. And so he's going to start answering some things. He asked for the kid to be brought to him, verse 20. So they brought him, being the kid. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. And you can just feel the emotion behind that answer. Been in this a long time. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. So this is interesting. You can read this as a parent and say, I can, I can sympathize with this guy. But even if you are not a parent, you can still sympathize and say, what do you do when you're in a situation that you cannot resolve your pain? And uh, the question that gets asked here is, if you can do anything. And so Jesus is going to respond. Watch what he says in verse 23. If you can... And I think you probably paused here. That's my assumption. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now, let me lean on that for a second because I think that is so incredibly transparent of this dad and I think it's more applicable to you and me than maybe we want to admit. He says, I do believe, but I also question. So if you've ever been in a scenario because of your dilemma, fill in the blank as to what your dilemma is, but it's causing arguing and you're coming to the Lord and you're saying, I do believe. I also have things that I've watched from childhood. My sight is competing against my belief. I think most of us can identify with, I believe in faith and I've watched a lot of evidence that has competed against that faith. And so this is what is the scenario here that Jesus is dealing with and responding to. 
Now, once again, I would just kind of recap to the disciples. The disciples, uh, he had asked, what are you arguing with them about? And they believe you gave us authority over evil spirits. We've seen that. But conversely, it didn't work this time. To the crowds, he says, oh, you unbelieving generation, how long must I be with you? And they would say, we do believe that God Almighty exists. We just don't believe that it's you. So give us more signs. Give us more evidence. Give us more proof. To the dad, he says, how long has he been like this? And then he's going to say, if I can, everything is possible for him who believes. And I think in this context, when I pull away from this story and I see these three dilemmas coming together in the conflict, I also can insert you and me in there. And I can say, I think confidently, that at some point in your journey with the Lord, at some point in my journey with the Lord, you will experience a collision of dilemmas where faith and sight compete against one another. And um, it is likely that you'll argue with the people around you. It's likely that you'll argue with God. The dilemmas are colliding and you're like, Lord, how long? Lord, why? When? Who? You'll argue with yourself, I should have never, I should have never, I should have never. You'll argue with the ones that share your name or share your DNA or share your address. You'll argue with the people that you work with. And at the root of it, it's just a collision of dilemmas. To start to turn this, Jesus is going to deal with the evil that started this. And he says in verse 25, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit you deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Amen. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. Now, if you imagined if that happened today during church, that would be a sight. You would be like, oh, snap, what happened to Bridgeway? <laughs> um, but keep in mind, Jesus is in full control here. Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. And then watch this. This conversation then is going to go private with the disciples. And it says, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, this kind can come out only by prayer and fasting. So there's something about this that to the disciples he begins to answer, that this only comes out by prayer and fasting, that the prayer and fasting, listen, the prayer and fasting is not about what you say to God to get him to do something. The prayer and the fasting is about how he does something in you. And that you remember and you recall in your prayer and your fasting and your coming to the Lord that he is your source. He's the source of the anointing. He's the source of the wisdom. He's the source of the strength. He's the source, not simply that you're walking in the source. And so this brings us to this thing that I think a lot of us deal with. A lot of us deal with dilemmas from time to time. We're faith and sight. And we have this verse. I'll leave you with this last, or not, not our last verse, but we're headed there. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we live by faith, not by sight. So let's talk about that. Um, I think at times, sight will actually support your faith. We see that from Scripture for some people. We see it with Thomas. Thomas says, I won't believe until I see the scars. There are some times that the Lord will afford you seeing something that will actually support your faith. But there's also going to be times that sight will sabotage your faith. Uh, you'll see some things, and faith won't jump to the front just yet, and you'll question we see that through numerous people in the scripture where sight actually sabotaged their scenario. I, I've, I've said for me personally, and I've been transparent about this, I don't apologize for being honest about this, that for me in my life, independent of pastoring for Joel, faith is primary to who I am. You can put me in Nebraska, you can put me anywhere, and I'm going to find faith 
as my primary source. However, I will also admit that sight sometimes is quicker. It gets to my thinking faster. So it's like I'm often having to real sight back in. No, no, no. I'm going to trust the Lord in this situation. Sight jumps to the front or tries to regularly. And so we live by faith, not by sight, understanding that I can have dilemmas at times. And while sight is trying to jump to the front, I'm going to make sure that faith is primary here. Um, A few years ago, uh, Carolee and I had the privilege of taking our kids to a trip to California. We went to San Diego and we were coming up to, uh, we did this kayaking tour in uh, La Jolla and uh, we were going into these caves and everything and it was a guided expedition and one of the things before we got to these these caves that we were going to be going in and out of is uh, there was this real amazing cliff, like just this vertical cliff line right on the beach And up at the top of the cliff were these million-dollar homes. And when I say million, it would have been excessive of that. Uh, You know, multi-million-dollar homes. Really big. You could tell they were really big even from being out in the kayak out in the water. And uh, I would imagine exquisite. And uh, the guide was telling us that, you know, the the owners of those homes are in quite a dilemma. Because none of them can sell them. No one will buy them. Big, beautiful homes. Problem. That cliff that they're built upon is eroding. And little by little by little by little by little, every year it keeps eroding closer to the homes. So nobody will buy the homes knowing that the erosion is headed to the home. So you're stuck with a home that you can't stop the erosion And you can't get rid of what you have. And I think it's an incredible visual for how sometimes we view our dilemmas. I've got this home I've built. I've got this marriage. I've got this family. I've got these kids. I've got this job. I've got this whatever it might be. And I'm watching the erosion come to it. I'm watching it creep towards it. And my sight is jumping ahead of the faith. And I just don't know that this ever gets changed. And I just don't know how I ever get out of this. And you can be like the dad that says, I do believe, but I also have unbelief that's jumping to the front right now. You can be like the crowd that's saying, I need more evidence, I need more proof, I need more evidence, I need more proof. You can be like the disciples that say, it worked before, but I don't feel it's working right now. And we're coming back to this statement of we live by faith, not by sight. So I want to give you just a simple fill in the blank today, some homework. And this is not just for us to fill in today, but this is homework for the week for all of us. If you identify with the dad scenario in this story, here's your fill in the blank. Feed your belief. Feed your belief. There's a real interesting passage in the book of Hebrews that says to cast not away your confidence. That you can be in scenarios where you can put your confidence in God or your confidence in who he is, your confidence in what he'll do. You can put your confidence on trial. And it says, don't throw away your confidence. I I heard this this last week and I thought it was a great quote. I've heard it before, but I just heard it again and was reminded of a, a preacher of old. I don't even remember the preacher of old who said it. But he said this, evil wants you to doubt your faith and believe your doubts. You should believe your faith and doubt your doubts. So I'll say that again. I thought it was a great statement. Evil wants you to doubt your faith and believe your doubts. You should believe your faith and doubt your doubts. So I want to encourage you, if you're in the dad scenario and you're like, I'm coming to the Lord with something that has worn me out, it's a dilemma, to feed your belief. You feed your belief in the word. You feed your belief in messages. You feed your belief by coming to the Lord regularly. And you will find that he's incredibly gracious to you in the middle of that. 
If you're in the crowd and you're like, I need more evidence, I need more signs, sight is winning the day in my life right now, then here's your fill in the blank. Sight will never supersede faith. It's easy to think, I need to see, I need to see, I need to see, but you will never find in the scriptures where God is putting sight over faith. It might supersede it for you at a situation, but it'll never supersede faith regarding the Lord. He will always bring you to a place of, will you trust me? And I I really, I don't know who I'm talking to on this. It could just be maybe one person, but you might have a decision this week or coming soon. And I want to encourage you as a brother to you in the Lord, to make your decision with faith. I'm not saying you're reckless. I'm not saying you're stupid. But do not let sight be the determiner of your course. We live by faith. And sight should never supersede faith. Now, to the third group, if you're in the disciple group, where you're like, I've trusted the Lord before, but this time it didn't work. Or I've prayed for people before, this time it didn't work. To the disciples, here's our fill in the blank, get strengthened in prayer. What is prayer? Our prayers are spending time with the Lord. That's in his word, that's in our communion with him, that's in worship with him. Sometimes it's scheduled, sometimes it's unscheduled, sometimes it's in your bedroom, sometimes it's in your car, sometimes it's in a variety of places. Don't just restrict it to a certain window in the morning or before you go to bed. Try and live, like Paul said, to pray without ceasing, to stay in communion with the Lord. Why? Because there's a strengthening in that. I will assure you of this, that prayer will strengthen you more for future decisions than your previous ones will. Your previous circumstances won't do a great job at strengthening you. So you stay in that place of, I'm going to pray. I'm going to spend time with the Lord. Now let me lean into this before we start to ramp to a close. With the disciples, prayer was an interesting thing. Prayer was as much community as it was an isolated thing. So prayer for the disciples, they would isolate sometimes in prayer, but they also would gather in community in prayer a lot of times. You'll find them clustering in prayer together. And I want to encourage you, if you say, Joel, I need to be strengthened right now. I feel like I'm facing dilemmas and arguing and I feel weakened and I feel worn down. You can get strengthened with other people. You can get strengthened in a place of prayer together, whether that be uh, you know, a small group, whether that be a ministry group, whether that be friends that you have at work who are faith people. You go to lunch and you pray together. Uh, you can do that together. You can get strengthened together. Now, I, I want to highlight something that we've got going on that's going to begin this Saturday. Uh, And this is a very defined community that often will find themselves, I I need strength. And uh, that is for a group that you have lost somebody. If you've lost a loved one. Uh, We ran a group uh, this past spring um, called Grief Share. Grief Share is simply a curriculum. It's a 13-week curriculum. And uh, Jennifer Hernandez, who oversees our women's ministry as well as our volunteer serve teams, um, she is the one that headed this up in the spring. And it was really a phenomenal group of people that have lost somebody that were able to find some strengthening with one another. They're going to begin another group uh, co-led by Travis Moffat, who was up here, our missions director. They're going to co-lead this together this uh, summer. But if you're in a context that you have lost somebody and the grief is still like, I don't know how to get through this. This might be an incredible um, group for you to be a part of to get strengthened together. Um, where you're able to pray together, and it could be a blessing to you. Um, I'll say one more group, and that is we do regular prayer nights uh, once a month in here, and we'll be doing one next Sunday. Uh, The reason I want to promote it this week is if you have not been baptized, we would love to have you out for that 
you know, we'll be doing baptisms along with this prayer night. And I think it would be a great time for us to be able to pray together. But I just want to encourage you, do not feel that you have to pray alone all the time. You can pray with brothers and sisters. Now, let me give you one last verse, and then we'll start to bring it home. Um, the verse that we've been in or touched on all, every week of this series has been in John 16, verse 33. And we'll put it on the screen here for you. I've told you these things. This is the night that Jesus is about to be betrayed. And he's telling the disciples, these are departing words. And he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Please hear me not with your ears, but hear me down in your soul. He said, in me you may have peace. Not the dilemma, not the circumstance, not in the other people, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, philipsis. Sometimes it will be such a dilemma, but take heart. You don't have to argue with everybody. You don't have to be in that collision. I have Nakao. I have overcome the world. In me, you may have peace. This week, whatever you're facing, whether you say, Joel, in the story, I identify more with what the dad is carrying, or you say, I identify more with what the disciples are carrying, or you say, I identify with the claims of the crowd of needing evidence and proof, I would just want to remind you in him. The story of this whole series is in him. His body is divided so that you can conquer. He has made way so that you and I can experience the presence of God in our lives. And I pray that this week, I pray that this week that he would fill you, that he would fill you with his presence. I want to pray for you this morning. Father, we thank you for this time. And Lord, this week, for whatever dilemmas that we might carry, scenarios that cause great emotion and prayer and maybe even arguing, and Lord, may we be reminded today and be reminded this week that in you we may have peace and that we can walk in the presence of God. I pray, Father, that you would refresh your family. I pray that you would refresh your sons or you'd refresh your daughters. For the dad that has a dilemma, that you would do a supernatural work in their behalf. Obviously, we don't know the timing, but we do pray for the supernatural to engage the natural. To your name and to your glory. For the disciple that's frustrated and confused about what used to work and no longer works, Lord, I pray, Father, that they be reminded of their faith in you. I pray, Father, that their faith be bolstered and they do not cast away their confidence in you. And for anyone that is in the crowd, so to say, that just needs more evidence, needs more proof, I pray, Lord, that they would see you clearly because you alone are enough. Lord, today we submit it all to you. Holy Spirit, we ask that the name of Jesus would be lifted high and glorified in our lives. We thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Hey, before you're dismissed, I wanna just highlight two things very quickly. Um, design team. If, um, if you have ever been intrigued or interested in helping us do set designs, we, we do them around Christmas, we do them around Easter, for, we're going to be doing one for VBS, Vacation Bible School, we're going to be doing a, a lot of build for our father-daughter dance, which our father-daughter dance is going to be July 22. Uh, it's going to be a circus theme, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but if you're interested in, in being a part of design team, Pastor Joe Joseph Harrison is a key part of that team, and he'll be down front over here after service. If you'd like to be a part, you can just come chat with him. If you're online, you can just email him and talk with him in that regard. We'd love to have your partnership. Last thing is just uh, with the 6K walk. I just want to remind you, we'd love to have your partnership with us. And I just want to give one, one little bit. 
maybe you're watching today and you're like, I'm in New Hampshire. Or, you know, I'm, we have a number of people who watch from different locations outside of Florida. And uh, you can participate too. You can still partner with us and do a walk there. And even for anybody online or here, you're like, Saturday just doesn't work for us. We've got games that day. You can still partner with us and then walk on Monday or walk on Tuesday. And we'll talk more about that uh, over the coming weeks. Uh, but we'd love to have everybody who can be a part of it. And maybe you got to do a, a relay. Talk with your family today at lunch and say, okay, I'll walk the first K, you walk the second K, you walk the third K, you know, partner up to to do it. It'll be a great time. So with all that said, hope you have a fantastic afternoon. Mom's at home, mom's here. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. You're all dismissed. so much for being with us. We really do count it as a privilege anytime that we get to connect together and uh, certainly on a special day like Mother's Day. Uh, the fact that you've taken the time to be here today is really important and special to us. Uh, I pray that you have a wonderful, wonderful day together. Eat some food, take those photos, have some good laughs. And uh, if you possibly have any questions for us pertaining to what it means to walk in faith, what it means to walk with the Lord, maybe you have a question about getting connected with Bridgeway. How can I get connected, whether it be in groups or volunteering, or how do I get to know people? Uh, on the bottom of your sermon notes are some QR codes. Those come straight to us and uh, we'll be able to follow back with you and help you along your way. And uh, maybe even uh, you have some questions about events. We'd love to get you our, our calendar that uh, shows what's going on for the summer. But I want you to know uh, we're in it with you. We're excited to be connected with you. And I pray that the Lord blesses you immensely. With all that said, I'm going to let you go and get to your Mother's Day festivities. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. God bless you.